Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Real people doing real deals in real estate and no fake gurus allowed. We bring you the best and the most real real estate investors in the space. They'll be showing you the good, the bad, and the ugly of real estate investing. Like, share, subscribe, get notified. It's the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today, we have the $2 billion man, Mr. Brad Blazer. Hey, how you doing, folks? Glad what? to be here with Ricardo this morning. Um, glad to have you here, Brad. Uh, you know, guys, this gentleman has raised over $2 billion for multiple projects. And he specializes on how to raise private money. This is what we're going to talk about today. But... In a nutshell, Brad, uh, Brad give me a, a the five minute rundown on who you are and where you come from, kind of like your a little bit of, of your background. Sure. Well, you know, I was kind of fortunate that at a relatively young age, in my twenties, uh, while I was going to school in college, I uh, went to work for a real small oil company, and uh, basically the CEO, the owner, said, "Look, you know, we're going to teach you how to get on the telephone, how to reach out to people, and uh, how to raise money." And so, uh, you know, I was doing it between classes, going in after school, you know, literally working about 12 to 15 hours a week. Uh, but I got real good at it. You know, I was making close to 100 grand, you know, drove a Porsche around as a little 21-year-old kid. And I'm like, man, I wonder, like, how successful could I be if I learned how to do this full time and contributed 40 hours a week? Wow. So, uh, you know, unbeknownst to my parents who had scrimped and saved their entire lives to put me through college, I just quit showing up. Uh, basically just dropped out and uh, kind of ventured off into the oil and gas business, went to work for a second company, uh, doing exactly the same thing. Unfortunately, found out through one of my investors that was in the oil business uh, that they were committing fraud. And so uh, I immediately resigned, obviously not wanting to be associated with any bad people. And uh, I was 23, and all of the people that I had worked with, all these investors, had no idea how young I was because I was doing all of this over the telephone. You know, back in the 80s, we didn't even have Zoom or uh, Internet. And so they said, well, Brad, you know, what are you going to do now? And I just saw, like, a huge door open in my life, realizing this is like the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because I got all these investors that love and trust me. And so I said, well... I'll start an oil company. I knew nothing about drilling a well. I had never done that, knew nothing about running a million-dollar business. And so I immediately went out, Ricardo, printed up some letterhead, some stationery, just got on the phone, started raising money. And uh, over the course of 10 years, man, we built a multi-million-dollar business, raising millions a month, uh, you know, drilling programs, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And then, uh, you know, in the late 1980s, oil prices plummeted, tax laws changed, and so... I was kind of forced to collapse the business, but I tell people we did it the right way. We never had to file for bankruptcy because I never had any debt on the books. And uh, went back to school, kind of came out, and, uh, you know, was a little bit disillusioned uh, because here I had a diploma. I had just graduated from college, but everybody was offering me starting salaries close to what I would make in a good month. <laughs> right. And I'm just like, you know, this isn't going to work, folks. I'm obviously very overqualified. And so there was a long period in my life uh, where I was depressed didn't know what the hell I was going to do, was very disillusioned. And then I just realized, like, my primary skill is knowing how to raise money. Like, I raised millions of dollars, not only for my own business. So I went to work in the industry, basically, uh, financial services, you know, working for these big real estate syndicators, big private equity firms, some of the world's largest global financial services companies, really just aligning myself with them and raising massive amounts of money, $2 billion. And, uh, you know, after doing that and making a great living, I just realized there's other people that need to know how to do this because I've learned that the biggest problem a lot of entrepreneurs have, a lot of business owners have, is they need money to scale or grow their business. And, you know, going to a bank is one solution. Personally, I don't think that's the best. And so today we run a global coaching business where we teach people literally how to attract, how to raise, and how to close investor capital or maybe to launch a fund so that you can build, buy, or scale a business or invest in something special like real estate. That's good. So um, when, so you went, you started in the early 80s, mm -hmm. right, raising money for 
the the other company. Correct. Then that you discover that they were a fraud. <coughs> you resign. Then you uh, you went and started your own. When did you shut down your company? Uh, when uh, like when the buzz happened? Like what year was yeah. that? Yeah. So um, I started my oil company in 1983. It's 23 okay. years old. Uh, we had a great run, and it was probably uh, the early 1990s, like 92, 93. Okay. Uh, because, you know, the, the oil bust back in the 80s was the late 80s, and then, of course, the Tax Reform Act was 1987 Tax Reform Act. And so, you know, I was putting money back into the business, like feeding the alligator, you know, like, hey, I need to make this work, need to make this work. And I just get to a point as an entrepreneur where I realize when there are things affecting your business that you don't control, Sometimes it's, as Sharon Lecter would say, time to adapt and make a change. Not yeah. necessarily quit, but adapt and make a change, right, right, go right. in a different direction. And so I just realized, you know, should I could be writing big checks every month for like the next five years? I don't know. And it would just have killed me. And yeah. I didn't want to go to the bank and borrow against my reserves. So I told my wife at the time, look, you know, I made the decision. We're going to collapse the company. We're going to take care of all of our people. We're going to give them severance, do this the right way. And during that time... I was obviously, you know, like, I don't have any idea what I'm going to do. You know, you go from right. making close to seven figures or seven figures or better to now essentially being unemployed. <laughs> you know, while you have savings in the bank, you need to realize you need to go in a different direction. Right. Good. That's good. So, um, so that's 92, 93. Then you went to college. Went back to school because I dropped out. Yeah. Got a degree. What do you got a degree on? I got a degree basically in business and finance. Business. Okay. And then you got reengaged into uh, raising capital again. Correct. When is it that you that you went and started doing what you're doing today? Literally about two and a half years ago. Okay. And, and, the, and the way that that evolved <clears throat> is after I had basically collapsed my business, um, I started the process of writing a book. Okay. Because I was like, you know, very few 20-year-olds start a multi-million dollar oil company. I need right. to share my story. So I wrote a book. But then, you know, life kind of took its course of events and went in a different direction. I got married, and so I never finished the book. And I was cleaning up my office about two and a half years ago, and I saw the floppy disk. <laughs> a floppy disk, right? We don't even floppy. have those anymore. Don't even have Some them. people watching <laughs> these don't even know what that is, you know? <laughs> That's like an 8-track cassette for those of you that were yeah. just born in the last 20 years. You don't even know what 8-track is. But I found the floppy disk in my office, and I'm like, oh, my God, shit, you know, there's the book I started. And I said, I need to finish that. And it was not necessarily for me. It was for my daughter because now I got a daughter and I wanted to show her that, you know, when you start a project, you finish, finish and also it. to leave it as a legacy. So I it largely started from scratch, right? The book, I self-published it. It was up on Amazon. And uh, one day, one of my good friends called me and said, man, your book's number one. And I was like, like, where? Like, you know, I don't have any idea how this happened. Right. Like on Amazon, on New York Times bestseller. He's like, no, man, apparently over in England, in the United Kingdom, one of the major literary blogs just rated your book as the number one book for young entrepreneurs. And I was like, you got to be shitting me. He's like, no. So he sent me the link. Sure enough, my book was number one on a list of the top ten books. Now, a couple weeks prior to that, I had appeared on a podcast over there that was one of the largest uh, uh, UK-based podcasts. Okay. Uh, UK Kajadori has a big podcast based out of London. I was on his show, so maybe that's how it happened, but I didn't care. So I took that list. And what does a smart entrepreneur do? He takes that and he sends a copy of the book with that to every university here in the United States that has an entrepreneur program. So I said, excuse me, I sent it to the dean. Hey, you know, my name is Brad Blazer. My book's number one for entrepreneurs. Would love to add any value. I can, blah, blah. They started calling me. Hey, Mr. Blazer, thank you so much, man. We'd love to have you come in, speak to the students here, talk about what you do. And so that, as I say, got the ball rolling about two and a half years ago. Then eventually radio shows started to pick up on the shit. So I started getting on radios. They called me up, hey, we see what you're doing, man. We'd like to have you on for a radio interview. Great. Then TV. So I started basically creating what I call this momentum. And the mistake I made initially was I just wanted my book like to do well. I was focused on selling the book. I didn't even have a coaching program. And then finally I was introduced to Coach Michael Burt. And I heard him speak, and I said, I need you in my life. I, I want to do what you do. I want to be on stages. I want to coach people. So we started a coaching program called Build Your Beast, which was largely more mindset success coaching. And, you know, it was doing well, but it wasn't doing as well as I wanted it to be doing. And so I went to Coach Bert, and I said, hey, 
you know, it's going great, but it's not going fast enough, and I'm not making nearly as much as I think I can. He said, you're too wide in what you're teaching. There's plenty of mindset coaches. Like, you get to find, like, your niche. And he said, like, what is your hard skill? Like, what is the one thing you do better than anybody you know? And I didn't know. I had no idea at the time. And then one day, Ricardo, I was watching Steve Harvey on TV talking to his audience. And he was telling his whole audience, everybody here in my audience has a special, unique talent. It's like when you were created by the maker, he put something inside you. And the problem is most people will never figure out what that is. And so they go through life on this treadmill, they get a job, yada, yada. And about a week later, it hit me. I said, my hard skill is raising capital. I do that better than anybody I know. He said, bingo, that's it. And so we've created Capital School. Capital Con is a global brand. We now have students in seven countries around the world, Canada, the United Kingdom, here in the U.S., Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, that all want to learn how to raise money because the language of attracting and talking to investors is universally the same anywhere you go in the world. Mm -hmm. The only thing that might be different is the securities regulations from one country to the next. So you need to have counsel depending on where you're located. And so that's what we do today. And, uh, you know, it's great. In addition to that, I, I practice what I preach. We raise money through my fund. And then, of course, we also use that capital to go out and invest in multifamily. That's awesome. So um, two, two and a half years ago, roughly, you, you started Capital Con. Um, what were you doing before that? Before that, I was working basically in uh, financial services, raising massive amounts of money for other people. You okay. know, there's a company based out of Los Angeles. Smart Stop Asset Management. Today, they're one of the top five operators of self-storage in North America and also up in Canada. Over the course of two years, I raised about $180 million for these wow. guys. You know, it's a lot of money. I raised $45 million out of the state of Israel through a fund in Israel that invested with us. And so I tell people that come into my coaching or just come into existence, they get to know me. If you're raising money today as an entrepreneur, like real estate, for example, a lot of real estate entrepreneurs raise money, you know, they're getting 50000 or 100000 to fix, rehab, flip a house. And they're like, man, I want to take my business like to a whole new level. Great. I'm the guy that can help you do that because the biggest check I've ever been handed is $25 million. You're getting handed checks for fifty to hundred. So maybe let me show you how to put together a fund and raise five or $10 million. Or just get into family offices. So instead of getting 50, 100, you're now having conversations to get one to five million. And so, you know, that's largely how I've evolved this because we have a lot of real estate entrepreneurs that want to get into the business. They go to some guru, you know, like Ron LeGrand or Dolph DeRose, or there's plenty of them out there that teach real estate. But then when they go through the curriculum and the course, they're like, man, I can't get started because I don't have any capital. And I tell people, that doesn't have to be a limiting belief or an obstacle. Why? Because there's plenty of money out there, man. You just yeah. need to be taught how to approach people and how to ask for that money and create those deals. And so for anybody that's listening or watching the podcast, if you're stuck or you feel that you're not able to go out there and raise the money to really accelerate or launch your business, you know, DM me, look us up, start to follow us, because that really is the solution that unlocks the key to get people to move forward. That's good. So what, are, what would you say are the basics to raise money? A couple things. Number one is you need to understand that very few people are going to invest with you unless they're family or friends until you build trust. Yeah. Okay? And the biggest mistake I see people make, like I talk to hundreds of people a week, and I say, have you tried to raise money? Yes. How's it going? Failed miserably. I've given up. I'm like, well, kind of like tell me what you did. Let me be the doctor. Let me dissect what you are doing. And what I find out is that they're pitching or they're talking about the deal way too early in the process. And I say, you know, the person you're talking to is going to shake their head. They're going to be polite. They might even ask to have you send them the stuff. But when it comes to writing a check, fat chance. Because what you did is you started pitching too prematurely in the process. So what we've perfected literally over raising money for 25 years is something that I call the four-step blueprint. It's understanding that to build trust, and there's a great book called The Trust Economy, written by a guy named Philippe de Conner, and I recommend it to anybody that wants to learn how to raise money. He said there are six things that need to happen sequentially, one after the other, to build the trust. One, great introduction, perception. People look at you, and they're evaluating you like, do I ever want to have a second date with Ricardo? Mm -hmm. It's everything, the way you dress, the way you shake hands, the quality mm -hmm. of your business card, everything is perception, your website. Then the next is what I call temptation. 
that's where I'm asking you questions, Ricardo. Like when you invest, do you like to look for income? Do you like growth? Are you looking for both? How important are tax benefits to you? Are you investing to do something special with your money, like put your kids to college or maybe buy a vacation home? You need to uncover what I call the temptation that is going to be the motivation that leads that person to invest with you, right? right? Because people will tell you what you need to know to close them. The problem with most salespeople is they talk too much. No, you need to listen by asking those questions. Then the third step is the connection. Investing is a connection. It is an emotional decision somebody makes because of your confidence and the belief they have in you. So you start looking, hey, is Ricardo starting to follow me on LinkedIn yet? Or on Instagram, is he giving me a thumbs up on some of my posts? If you see that, now you know that that connection is starting to unfold. And then you get to what I call the most important, which is step four. That's the validation. You need to validate that person trusts you before you pitch. And there's one sentence that I teach all of my students that basically validates and also uses one of the most powerful takeaways, which is basically the takeaway close. And it's simply this, Ricardo, man, I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the last couple of weeks. But like I've told you right now, I just don't have an investment that I can discuss with you at all. And the reason is we always like to give our existing investors the right of first refusal on all of our new programs. So it's very rare that we have an opening. But in the event I have a small opening or an allocation at some later date, I would just love to put your name on a list and get back in touch with you if that makes sense. Would that be okay? And when Ricardo says yes, that'd be great. He's validated that he now trusts me enough to be added to my list to call back if and when I have an opportunity. He doesn't know that I may never call him back. So that's the takeaway close. Very right. powerful technique. But when I call him and I warm him back up, it's like, hey, you know, you asked me to put your name on the list. Today I'm just going down my list. I have a small allocation. I'd love to tell you about it. And that's now when you can pitch. So then you send the materials. He looks at the deal. And then hopefully on the call number four, you're answering questions, you're closing, and you're getting a capital partner. Mm. That's good. That's good. So, um, I used to uh, I used to raise a lot of private money when yeah. I was doing flips, right? I don't do flips anymore, so I don't I don't have the need to raise private money. Um, I remember one in one particular occasion, I I got this gentleman um, uh, on my car, and 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 right from the get go, he said he had eighty thousand. Mm-hmm. So I got eighty thousand um, dollars. I want to see if there is anything we can put it to work on. And I said sure, but I didn't really listen to the number, you know, I was like, I'm just going to go build a relationship with this guy. Yeah. So I took him around, showed him all the projects that we had, some of the rentals. But for the most part of that day, we just shoot the shit. Like, we were just talking. Yeah, is it? You know, like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I was in the Army, and I did this, and I did that, and I went to Vietnam, and, and you know, and we're having coffee, and, hey, look at this house. This, mm-hmm. this, uh, this one is a rental, and this one we're flipping. By the time, I used to call it the money tour. Yeah, I, yeah, I got so good it, at it. Yeah. I will get on my car, put him on my vehicle, run him around all of our projects. He said he had 80000 when we started. By the time we got done, he had a million. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Right? Because he had already built trust. Exactly. And he seen the, the action. Like, okay, these guys are legitimate. They're, right. they're buying, they're rehabbing, they're flipping. And that you said on your fourth step, it, it's so important, right, to – to build that rapport and to, and to uncover the need on why they're investing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Most people that I've seen crash, they just go for a check. Exactly. You, you, you're so desperate because you have a deal maybe under contract or you've already got a PSA purchase and sales agreement. You know you need to raise a few million dollars. So the second you start talking to people, you're like, hey, I got a deal. I need to see if you might have it. No, you cannot do that. Literally, when I talk to a prospective investor, the first conversation I have, like you did, man, it's just, I just want to know you, man. It's like, I don't have anything to sell you. I don't have anything to pitch you. I just want to know, like, do you have an interest in investing passively in real estate for the tax benefits, for the income, for the appreciation? They say, yes, great, man. And I just, you know, maybe send them some information on who we are, what we do. Then the second call, again, I don't pitch. Hey, Ricardo, I just want to make sure you got the information I sent you on who we are, what we do. And nine out of ten times, are like, yeah, I got it, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. Great, no problem, brother. You know, if it's close by or it's somewhere accessible, I'll wait while you get it. There's a couple things in there I would just like to bring your attention to. And then on that second call, that's really where I'm digging deep. I'm asking what I call those temptation questions. Because if you're talking to somebody twice, 
and you ain't trying to sell them anything. You're just adding value. You're educating them on passive investing in real estate, maybe in multifamily. You're building that trust. They're like, this is the first dude that's ever called me that had ever tried to sell me something. Yeah. And then by the third call, when you finally ask them the permission, hey, you know, I'd just like to put your name on a list and get back to you in the event we have something exciting to talk about. They're like, sure, I'd love you to do that. And so by using that blueprint and kind of what I call that, that, that progression, it allows people to have success when they raise capital because they're using a proven system. You know, I've gone to work as a sales manager, as a national director, and I tell people, we're going to use a script. And they all look at me like, oh. And I'm like, the reason we use it, guys, is because it fucking works. Yeah, it works. You know, now you can get off script once you become an expert and put your own spin on it, but you need to follow this. Why? Because it works. Once they realize it works, they're like, man, this is great. And so a lot of the people that get started in the program have success. I mean, I had a guy that was one of our students about two weeks ago on one of our accountability calls say, man, I just raised $200,000 this week. And I had him share, like, tell us, Eduardo, how did you do this? Like, like walk through the steps of how you just got the 200000 And so he explained, you know, on the call. And I said to all the other students, see, folks, if you do this and you put forth some effort and action, you can have the same results that Eduardo right. just did. Right. And so, you know, it's largely just understanding that process. You know, raising money is not hard. But it just takes time. It, it takes, takes effort. Time. Nobody's going to just, uh, you know, sign up for a program and expect wheelbarrows full of money to show up at your door. But if you build a system. Most people do. <laughs> Most people do. They, they, they want what I call the microwave success. Yes, exactly. You know, they got a microwave. They put $1 here, and now they want $100 to exactly. come out in one minute. It doesn't work like that, man. Exactly. It's like you got to put in the work. Yep. You got to follow the script. The script, we, we do scripts here all day long. Right, yep. That's all we do, yep. you know, for buyers and sellers. And what, when we don't have, like, traction, mm -hmm. it's because the guys are not using the script. Exactly. Exactly right. Correct. You know, hey, do you use the script? Uh, well, I was like, come on, guys. Yeah, you know. You need to get back to the basics. Get back on track. Yeah. Like, you know, why are you off the script? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, and you can see it in the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the guy took a bunch of freaking yeah. knuckleheads, <laughs> yeah. right? Yep. And he gave them a script. He trained them on the script. Exactly. How to speak, tonality, yep. you know, how to create a so report the over the phone. Yep. And they built a freaky monster, man. And, and, and you know, unfortunately for them, you know, it, it, they, they were selling yeah. stuff sure. that wasn't good. But um, And he blew up on them. But if they would have had the right vehicles, then he would have never went to jail. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, Absolutely. So, anyhow, guys, Brad was actually a sponsor to our last mastermind in, in April 30th, uh, May 1st and 2nd when we did it in Houston. And uh, he did a good job, man. He, he went and, um, and got on stage and spoke for about 20 minutes. Uh, he had people crying because he had some great stories, um, you know, related to, to his journey. And now he's going to be our speaker, one of our speakers in the, the Real Estate Entrepreneurs event at Mastermind in Miami, Florida, um, October 21st through the 24th. So if you want to come meet Brad, shake his hand, and, and maybe learn more about Capital School, uh, well, you can Google him and or uh, <laughs> find him on Facebook and Instagram and send him a message, number one. Uh, number two, you can come to the to the mastermind and get to know him at a personal level. Uh, he's teaching a lot of people that I know uh, how to raise money. And, um, and, you know, I highly suggest that you reach out to him if that's something you, that you really want to learn. But, Brad, thank you so much for stopping by today, man. I appreciate you. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to have you there in Miami, Florida, uh, hanging out with us and and telling people how it is that you do the, your your uh, private money. Uh, the, the best part about it is you'll get a copy of my book, Winning at the Capital Game. It's on Amazon, but if you come to the event, you'll get the chance to have it signed. Uh, and it literally outlines everything I know from A to Z about raising money, you know, venture capital, private equity, how to pitch, how to put together your PowerPoint, uh, the whole thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things, folks, you need to learn this skill. You know, I talk to literally, like I said, hundreds of entrepreneurs every day. And I say, like, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to start a company. I want to start a business. Or I want to invest in real estate. And my follow-up question to that is like, well, why haven't you got started? Yeah. And the answer is like, I don't money. have the money. Money. And I'm like, don't let that be a problem. You know, I tell you, Brad Lee tells you, Grant Cardone, because I know all these guys, 
Money grows in the pockets of other people. You were at the event this week. That's what Bradley yep. said, right? Money grows in other people's pockets. That's correct. And so once someone teaches you how to attract that interest and then what to say, all of a sudden that money comes out of their pockets and it now aligns yours. And that's what allows people like our mutual friend Robert Martinez to go out and build a $450 million real estate empire. That's correct. And I'll tell you, you know, I've raised about $180 million since I started just from investors. Cardone, same thing. My company, Five Star, same thing. And so, you know, learn this skill, folks, because it will stay with you the rest of your life. And whether you use it now or whether you use it at some time in the future, it's a skill that you can literally use to build buy your scale and take your business to the next level. Yeah, and, and it's one of those things to where you think about, you know, when you're gonna do uh uh like we like we just went to, to Nashville and and you uh you rented an airplane. Yeah, got a private we, jet, yeah. You got a private jet, we all flew in there. And I'm pretty sure your first question was, who's got my money for the jet? <laughs> that, that, that's that right. It's okay. I'm going to call Ricardo. Yeah. I'm going to call George. I'm going to call Eduardo. Yeah. I'm going to call all these guys. And we all did. I was like, okay, yeah. let's go. Let's pitch in. Let's, let's, let's do this deal, right? In opening a, a business or, or doing a syndication or doing a fix and flip, it requires private money. And that's what you got to be thinking about. Exactly. Who's got my money? That way, even though, if, even if you have the money, you know, you want to leverage other people's money, um, you know, and, and, and that's what's going to allow you to grow and scale raising capital. Yeah. So um, don't forget to hit share, like, and subscribe, guys. Yep. I will see you on the next one. Thank you so much for being there. Don't forget, Real Estate Entrepreneurs Event and Mastermind, April, no, not April, October 21st through the 24th. I had the other event in my, in my mind, yeah. <laughs> October 21st through the 24th, <clears throat> we're going to have Jorge Valdez as our keynote speaker. And we're going to have Mike Jones show up and, and, and do some, uh, sing a couple of songs and, and, and do a Q&A. So I will see you on the next one, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.